the air tonight with what may be the closest we've ever been to a hostage deal between Israel and Hamas, a large scale one, why the president is literally crossing his fingers, even while the fighting's getting worse around Gaza's hospitals. We'll take you live to the region as our team gets rare access to Israeli military operations. Plus, double trouble in the sky tonight. Tons of people, tons of bad weather, including at least one confirmed tornado just in the last few minutes. Now what you want to see three days before Thanksgiving, what you should know about this potentially record-setting holiday travel week, and why a new gig for the former head of OpenAI has the tech world freaking out. The stakes for Sam Altman and the rest of us in just a minute. Then the chainsaw-wielding celebrity libertarian who's about to be inaugurated as Argentina's new president by he's giving Trump vibes and what his rise means for politics here at home in tonight's breakdown. Plus, how new research is linking a specific type of belly fat to Alzheimer's. That's later on in the show. Hey there, I'm Hallie. And tonight, a deal to get the hostages held captive by Hamas freed looks like it's closer than ever to actually coming through, according to the White House, with President Biden offering up a little glimmer of hope late today. Listen and watch this. Is it hostage deal here? Yes, he says, the president holding up and crossing his fingers there for the 200-plus people kidnapped by Hamas terrorists on October 7th. With this news of a potential, potential release coming as we're seeing heavy fighting now around another hospital in northern Gaza, the Israeli military expanding its ground attacks. Eyewitnesses at the Indonesian hospital report bombing, gunshots, artillery strikes. The World Health Organization says they don't know how the 700 people inside are doing because they can't reach them. Israel says its troops, in their words, directly targeted a specific source of enemy fire. The Indonesian foreign minister condemning the attack, which Hamas says has killed at least 12 people. At a different hospital in Gaza, hundreds of patients are still reported to be trapped inside. But not something like 30-plus premature babies. That's because those babies have been evacuated in the last 24 hours. Tonight, we're learning they have arrived safely in Egypt. Israel putting out new video today claiming to show hostages and tunnels inside and under that hospital called Al-Shifa. One of the videos showing what Israel says are hostages getting forced inside that hospital. You see it here on the morning of the October 7th terror attack. We've got to be clear here. NBC News cannot confirm when those videos were taken or who's actually in them. All of it comes as our own Keir Simmons is getting rare access to Israeli military operations at a base just north of Gaza, giving some new clues on where this war could go next. I want to bring in our reporters who've been working tirelessly in this region. Raf Sanchez and Keir Simmons are joining us now live, both from Tel Aviv. Keir, we'll get to your exclusive in just a second. But Raf, let me start with you on the hostages here. It feels like we've been hearing the drumbeat now, the potential for a release for more than 24 hours at least. What else do we know about when this could actually happen? So, Hallie, as we speak, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is a couple of miles from where I am at the Israeli Defense Ministry, and he is meeting with the families of the hostages. That meeting is still ongoing, but we have some sense of what's being said because a number of families walked out early. And, Hallie, these families are deeply, deeply worried because they have the sense that this deal, if it does come together, is not going to be for all 240 of the hostages. It is going to be for a smaller number of them. And that does chime with what sources have been telling Kier and our other colleagues, that this deal is likely to be for a smaller number of hostages, potentially several dozen, most likely women and children first. We don't yet know what the timeline is here, uh, and we don't also know whether Israel is going to agree to release any Palestinian prisoners from their own jails in exchange for this. But the basic outline here seems to be a number of Israeli hostages released over a staggered set of days in exchange for some pause, probably several days in the fighting. But the thing to stress here, Hallie, is that nothing is agreed until everything is agreed. We've been hearing that from the White House over the weekend, and these talks still could collapse before they're finalized. Ali. You, you talk about the potential if this deal is reached, and there's a lot of caveats, as you laid out there. It would potentially include some kind of a pause in the fighting here. That has obviously not been the case on the ground, with Israeli continuing its ground attacks in retaliation for that terror attack last month. Hospitals are the focus here, right? What else do we know about what's going on at both of these key hospitals, not just Al-Shifa, but the Indonesian hospital and, and where this might go? 
Yeah, so let's start at the Indonesian hospital. It is all the way up in the northern end of Gaza. It's where the fighting is most intensive. And over the last 24 hours, according to hospital officials, that medical facility has been surrounded by Israeli troops. We have seen and been able to geolocate video that shows Israeli tanks surrounding the hospital. The uh, Palestinian Authority is saying that 12 patients inside of the hospital have been killed by Israeli shelling over the last day. We asked the Israeli military about it. They say they came under fire from militants inside of the hospital. They returned fire. They are denying that they fired tank shells, not being specific about what kind of ammunition they used, but denying that they fired tank shells. Meanwhile, Hallie, at Al Shifa, there are still several hundred people inside, according to the Hamas run health ministry. Many of them are people who are too sick to leave. One of the only bits of good news uh, coming out of the hospitals, Hallie, is that 28 of those premature babies were able to cross from Gaza through the Rafah crossing into Egypt earlier today. They have had a very difficult short life so far. Some of them are in pretty serious condition. And Egyptian authorities are saying that they flew 12 of them straight from the border for intensive care in Cairo. So the whole world really hoping and praying that these little babies pull through. Ali? The, the world has been watching those babies holding its breath. Raf Sanchez live for us in Tel Aviv. Thank you. Kira, I want to go to you now here because you had some access here to some of these Israeli military operators who were in charge of the aerial attacks in Gaza. Talk to us about what you're learning and and where this fighting could go next, what clues you got from this? Well, we went to see them not far from Tel Aviv uh, here. Uh, they couldn't be identified because of the nature of their work. It's uh, Israeli Defense Force policy not to identify them. Uh, they're pretty young, I would say, in their 20s, honestly. One of them told me that a friend is actually among those who's been kidnapped, and yet at the same time they're doing this job, if you want to call it that, of this controversial job of piloting drones that are targeting the area around Gaza and beyond. Take a listen to what one told me. Are there moments in this process where you realize you've accidentally hit a civilian, and, and what impact does that have on you? I could say that war is messy. And we can train all day and all night not to hit civilians. But when Hamas trains all day and night so that we do hit civilians, sometimes they have the upper hand. When it happens, we as IDF soldiers take it very hardly, understanding that we'll have to be better next time and more precise, and that's what we train to do. More precise, uh, Halley, uh, it's thought, widely thought that these drones are more specific, more targeted than other kinds of bombs, if you like. It is relentless. You could hear a drone flying over us just when uh, he was talking there. But again, it is still controversial uh, legally and for many people ethically. So uh, this is a role that is new in the world, I guess you would say, uh, and one that not everybody agrees with. In addition to what you've been covering now for over a month, Kira, which is obviously this war between Israel and Hamas in Gaza, there is the discussion um, and, and one thing that we should talk about, which is the West Bank, right? And this is another area, I think we have a map we can put up to show people. Um, and things seem to be developing there as well. One of Israel's drone strikes happened there at least, right? And you visited there. Yeah, I, well, the West Bank is is incredibly tense and has been particularly since the October 7th terror attacks. But yeah, we went to the West Bank and we went there because uh, we uh, heard there was a drone strike there uh, on Friday night. And we were there on Saturday to see the funeral of five people, local people say. Now, one, both the Israelis and local people agree, uh, was the, the leader of the armed wing of uh, the Fatah movement, the Al-Aqsa Martyrs uh, Brigade and described as a terrorist by the Israelis. Both sides say that's the case. But on the other hand, a 15-year-old was also in, the, in a building where that drone target is, uh, and also someone walking past on the street, and it just goes to the point. Another aspect of this, uh, Halley, when we went there to see this funeral, uh, there was a sense of the community enraged, angry. Uh, and again, that's going to raise questions for people about whether or not, despite these drone strikes allegedly being more targeted, whether what impact they actually have in, in a place, uh, whether in fact they, they help uh, tackle extremism or fuel it.
Kier Simmons, live for us in Tel Aviv. Kier, we're grateful to you for all of your reporting. We want to point out to people that there will be more tonight on NBC Nightly News. Kier's interview, Kier's reporting at 6.30 Eastern with Lester Holt. You can watch it wherever you watch your local NBC station. Back here at home tonight, a potentially nightmarish collision of super busy travel and super bad weather in some of the country, setting off alarm bells ahead of what could be a record-setting Thanksgiving week. You've got this tornado watch in effect right now for some folks down south. Look, there's one tornado that's already been confirmed in Louisiana. More than 10 million of us are at risk of severe thunderstorms. And those storms, you know, could mean chaos for airlines. Check it out live right now. Travelers trickling into LAX, planes waiting at Philly's airport, more than 30 million people are expected to fly at some point in this holiday week. Okay, so lots of people plus lots of bad weather. Not exactly the world's best Thanksgiving recipe. Here's Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg one-on-one -on -one with our own Tom Costello. We've got people literally working around the clock and across the country on aviation safety. We're going to continue that and accelerate it. We've got meteorologist Bill Karen standing by with the latest forecast, but I want to get to our Morgan Chesky, who's out of Dallas, Love Field. So here we go. It is Thanksgiving week. We know a ton of people set to travel today and tomorrow. A ton of people travel after the holiday next Sunday, too. Talk me through what you're seeing and hearing tonight. Yeah, Hallie, a lot of people are getting ahead of the game plan here, showing up on Monday because we are talking about a significant influx of travelers. This could be the third busiest Thanksgiving travel season since the year 2000. Of course, coming out of the pandemic, that surge just continues to grow. We do know right now these are the dates you want to avoid. Everyone I'm seeing in Dallas Love right now, they're doing exactly that. Tomorrow going to be big. Wednesday is when Love is expecting their biggest influx of travelers, 44,000 or so, Hallie, on a typical day they're looking at about 10,000 so more than quadruple and then as you mentioned about 3 million people nationwide on Sunday alone going to be flying back home uh, from all of the turkey and trimmings and they're going to have a lot of people to compete with here not only the weather a potential issue here Hallie but we're talking about the fact that people are going to be driving through this as well not just flying and so that is why the same rules apply here plan a plan a b and potentially c because with this weather, we could have some flights be impacted as well as this system moves across. Uh, the big thing, sign up for an alert on your phone or email so that you don't leave home or arrive here at the airport, Hallie, only to find out your flight's canceled. In Florida, these are what some travelers are doing to stay ahead of the curve. Take a listen. We get out on a Monday and we come right back after before the crowds come. Getting here really was not a problem at all. If I hear that they're having problems, I go earlier. Right, so not everyone has the luxury of leaving on a Monday ahead of Thanksgiving. If you do have the bandwidth to do so, obviously one of those days not mentioned, traveling on Thanksgiving morning, certainly an option if you can make it to your destination in time, although you don't want to leave too much to chance with so many more people this year taking it to the air uh, to get to that holiday destination. Hallie? Morgan Chesky in the thick of it. Morgan, thank you. Let me bring in Bill Karens now because, Bill, it's not just wet. It's very windy in some spots. We talked about the tornado watches in effect. What's the biggest concern you're looking at tonight? And I know tomorrow you think is going to be kind of ugly. Yeah, tomorrow is very ugly for travel. Today is the uh, possibility of damage. And we already know that's what you just don't want to happen. Right before Thanksgiving, you know, you lose power for a couple days or, you know, God forbid your house gets damaged. You know, that's the possibility with two tornado watches. We haven't had a tornado threat in weeks, if not months. And so the first one is a watch till 7 o'clock. Still have to go through this in Alexandria and Lake Charles. Then Baton Rouge later tonight, Brookhaven, Jackson, Mississippi to Hattiesburg. This goes out through 11 o'clock Central Standard Time. So this threat goes well after sunset, and you know, nocturnal thunderstorms get very dangerous. So we have kind of two, two thunderstorms I've been watching closely. One is down here by Fort Polk, Louisiana. Again, severe thunderstorm warning with that. And then this stronger storm earlier did have a confirmed tornado with it. On and off, it's had some spin and rotation with it. Right now, it's not tornado worn. This is a severe thunderstorm warning, but you see all this bright magenta color. Definitely some large hail, gusty winds. And if a tornado does form, it would be in this area here, heading pretty much due east. So I have 
have my eyes here on Natchez. You're not in the severe thunderstorm warning, and it looks like the worst of the storm will head just to your north. But that's kind of the next big population center we'll be watching. And then tomorrow, not so much severe weather threat. This is just kind of the misery index going up with a lot of heavy rain and gusty winds for the east coast. So the airports, Charlotte, Raleigh, Richmond, D.C. to Philly, late in the day in the evening, New York City airports expect delays. I don't think we're going to get too many cancellations, but a lot of delays. And of course, if you're driving on the roads in these same exact areas, 95, 81, going through the Pennsylvania Turnpike, heading into the Ohio Valley, and then northern New England tomorrow night, if you're at any high elevations, it's going to be a mess. It's going to start as snow, go over to sleet, and then over to rain. Thankfully, that's all gone for Thanksgiving Day. The only problem we have on Thanksgiving Day is some snow in Wyoming and Idaho. Who knows? Maybe some people would actually enjoy that. Uh, get some white fluffy stuff to play in. And then by the time we get to Friday, still watching that building snowstorm in areas, maybe even Denver getting into that too. Then by the time we get to Saturday, kind of quiet, just a little bit of snow left over with that storm and not a lot of horrible stuff on Sunday. I know, Hallie, a lot of people have been saying that the busiest travel out of them all will be everyone going back on Sunday. Right. And this is what we like to see. There's not a lot of issues for everyone trying to get back home. Cross your fingers, it stays that way. Bill Karens, yeah. thank you very much. I know we'll talk again tomorrow. Appreciate it. Yeah. Let's take you back here to Washington now with some new reaction from the White House tonight as President Biden today celebrates his 81st birthday with the traditional turkey pardon. But it's another number getting a lot of attention tonight. Not just 81, but the number 40. You see it here. That's his approval rating, the lowest of his term so far. A number driven partly by how voters feel about the president's handling of the Israel-Hamas war and about how they feel about how old he is. As every day, he sets a new record for the oldest person to ever serve as president. I want to bring in Gabe Gutierrez, who's joining us now. Okay, so this new polling is out, coinciding with the president's birthday today. Talk me through, when I talk to Democratic sources, what I hear from those close to President Biden, because I do hear concern from some Democrats, but from Biden allies, I hear things like, hey, there's still a long way to go before the actual presidential election, before people actually start tuning in in a meaningful way to start making their decisions about who to pick for the White House. Does that sync with what you're hearing? Yeah, that's right, Hallie. This is something that White House hates, hate, 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 hate yeah. talking about the president's <laughs> age. They just despise it. They say it's not what voters are actually concerned about. However, you see, Hallie, those new poll numbers do show it's a significant concern. But, you know, you listen to White House Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre. She led off her White House briefing today highlighting what the White House does want to be talking about, so making the case that inflation has cooled, that, uh, you know, Americans are seeing lower prices for things they're going to have on their dinner table at Thanksgiving. The White House press secretary, again, making that case. However, she did. She was asked about these latest poll numbers. Take a listen to what she had to say pretty directly. We're not going to change the minds of Americans. I get that. Americans are going to feel how they feel, and we're going to respect that. We believe experience, this president having experience to get things done is important. So yeah, Hallie, perhaps not the most rousing message heading into 2024, essentially admitting that they're not going to change the minds of Americans. But look, looking at those latest uh, poll numbers from NBC News about uh, President Biden's handling of the Israel-Hamas war, uh, pretty significant, especially when it comes down to age. Looking at those numbers, just 34 percent of America of the respondents approve of um Actually, that's a, that's a different uh, poll. We'll take a look at that. Those are some of the concerns that voters are looking at. 74% say the president's age and fitness is a major concern. 62%, meanwhile, say president, former President Trump's multiple criminal and civil trials, trials are a concern. 60% uh, uh, mention uh, Hunter Biden's business dealings. And just 47% consider uh, former President Trump's age and fitness a major concern, even though the former president is not only is just a few years younger than President Biden. So the question is for a lot of these voters, why so much of a focus on President Biden's age as opposed to former President Trump's? For whatever reason, there you go. It's just a big difference in how many voters seem to be concerned about one versus the other half. Well, you make the point that Mr. Trump is in his late 70s. Gabe, something else you were just talking about, I want to pull on this thread quickly here, is the idea, when you talk about the age of some of the respondents to our poll, right, specifically younger voters, right. and what we're seeing is their real concern about the way that the president has handled the Israel-Hamas war. That seems to be driving increased dissatisfaction, specifically with that younger age group. Um, I think yeah. you can see it here. This is, I think, right. the graphic you were talking about. 
Exactly, and it's really remarkable to look at how they look at that. So, 56% of respondents, uh, you know, mentioned that uh, they disapprove of the president's handling of the Israel-Hamas war. But look at that age breakdown: 53, 41 for respondents over age 65. But look at that demographic: 18 to 34 years old. Just 20%. Of that group approve of the president's handling of the Israel-Hamas war, 70 percent disapprove. That's something else that the Biden team is going to have to deal with heading into the 2024 election. Will they able? Will they be able to convince those younger voters to turn out for President Biden and Vice President Harris, like they're expect, like you know, like they'll need them to yeah. in order to take on former President Trump, Hallie. Gabe Gutierrez, live for us there on the North Lawn of the White House tonight. Gabe, thank you very much. Looks like a panel of judges here in Washington could keep a gag order in place, but a more narrow one against former President Trump in his federal election interference case. This is based on some of the tea leaves during questioning today. Listen. Why does the district court have to wait and see and wait for the threats to come rather than taking a, a reasonable action in advance? Again, the standard is imminently impending, solidity of evidence. We have an inference from stuff that happened three years ago, countervailed, you know, contradicted by the evidence we actually have here, which is wall to wall. I mean, they are saying, oh, it's an imminent threat let me ask that someone you, could be harassed. This, and it, it doesn't happen. Okay, so right now, let me just tell you what's going on here. Right now, there's a gag order that is on pause because the three judges you see here are trying to figure out how to balance Donald Trump's right to free speech with protections for the people who are part of this case, accusing Mr. Trump of trying to overturn the 2020 election, which was legitimate. The whole point initially, right, was to get Mr. Trump to stop threatening prosecutors or potential witnesses or staff involved in the case. This is the judge who initially put that gag order in place. I want to bring in Ken Delanian, who's joining us now. So, like... Legal stuff aside, right? Like, and we don't have a decision yet, but reading the tea leaves, it seems as though this gag order will stay but be more narrow. What does that mean practically for former President Trump, who we have seen make these truth social posts, say things at rallies that are concerning to some of the people who are looking at court staff, et cetera? Right. It may mean that they find a way to craft an order that allows him to say, continue to criticize Jack Smith, the special counsel but not in a way that would incite a threat, potentially. I don't know what that's going to look like. Frankly, there was a lot of uh, head of a pin kinds of arguments today about what does the word target mean? And, mm. you know, and, and you, you heard... Yeah, how do you make that? How does that practically go into effect, though? Unclear to me. But okay. you heard that lawyer, um, Trump's lawyer, argue that you really can't show a nexus between a lot of this inflammatory rhetoric that Trump has engaged in these attacks and threats, direct threats, Prosecutor Jack Smith's team made the opposite argument. They said, no, in fact, there's a clear record, including a death threat to the judge in this case that came after Donald Trump tweeted, you know, if you come after me, I'm going to go after you. So, but this is a real clash between two fundamental American values, you know, free speech and a presidential candidate's right to speak in a campaign and a judge's right to prevent a criminal defendant from engaging in witness tampering and jury tampering uh, and, and, and behavior that potentially puts people's lives in jeopardy. If, if this were not the particular defendant that we're talking about here, if this were not the former president of the United States, do you believe that there would be this level of intense debate and discussion about this? Or would the gag order have already been in place, done, and Absolutely. Move on? I mean, okay. these, these things are standard. I, 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 mm. The um, special counsel lawyer said today that this is the first case in American history where a criminal defendant has been able to broadcast to a national audience, you know, savage criticism of the prosecutor, the judge, witnesses in this case, calling them lunatic, deranged, corrupt. That just doesn't happen in normal trials. When should we know which way the judges, this panel goes on this one? So they brought this on, an, they're hearing this on an expedited basis, so it could be days or weeks, and okay. almost certainly going to the Supreme Court. Um, real quick, there's also a, a gag order that the former president is fighting. Different case, yeah. New York, civil fraud trial having to do with his business, not having to do with election interference. Does anything that happened here in D.C. affect what happens in New York or two separate yes. things? Well, it, it's separate because it's it's about state law, but the principles are the same. It's the constitutional principle of free speech, which was the issue raised in New York. And so they're going to pay close attention to what this appeals court says. Ken Delaney and fascinating stuff. Thank you so much. Keep us updated. I know you will. Tonight, Sam Altman, who's changing the face of tech in this country, has a new job already after getting forced out of open AI. And now, after days of boardroom drama straight out of succession, hundreds of open AI workers are threatening to quit over what went down on Friday. Remember, as we told you then, that's when the board shocked pretty much everyone by saying they no longer had confidence in Altman. The backlash to that sparked rumors over the weekend he'd actually come back, then he was out again, and now he's got a new job because Microsoft basically immediately hired him. 
The Microsoft CEO says Altman's going to lead a new advanced AI research team there. It's a huge deal, right? Because Altman, in many ways, is the face of AI tech. You know, ChatGPT, yeah, that's him. That's his company. That's OpenAI. I want to bring in Jake Ward now. And Jake, I, I just want to go big picture for a sec, and then let's go nitty gritty. Because it feels to me like people sure. in tech are like going bananas, capital B, over this. Like it is so intense. It is, everyone's like, oh my, why is it such a big deal, right? CEOs come and go fairly often in Silicon Valley. Help, <clears throat> help the non-techies understand what's at stake here. Well, I think, you know, the, the big thing, right, is this fact, as you pointed out, that right, open AI is what put Jack GPT in all our lap. It is what has taught us the power of AI more broadly. And it is also one of the only companies in that space that operates in this funky kind of nonprofit way that was supposed to make it responsible, not just for making huge amounts of money, but also responsible broadly to humanity. The whole mission statement of the place, Halley, was the idea that it would sort of hold hold back from all of the possible uses of AI in order to make the most responsible version of it. It seems that there was some sort of philosophical difference between Sam Altman and, and uh, Greg Brockman, who had been the president of the company, and the board over that issue. The board sort of intimated as much when they talked about there being a lack of, of candid communications here. They kept talking about the central premise of the company and that that was somehow the issue at stake. We're not sure what their reasons were for firing him, but one, one of the most successful tech CEOs in the history history of tech is suddenly fired the day after he's giving major speeches to world leaders at APEC and uh, all over the Bay Area. He had just had a big dev day. The guy had no idea he was going to get fired and then suddenly was like that. It just is such a, a, a just a, it shakes the world, not to mention the fact that now his company's in all-out rebellion and suddenly he's got totally. this crazy new job at Microsoft. And are all these open AI workers threatening to quit? Or would they come over with him to Microsoft? Like, in other words, is Microsoft now poised to make some major, major breakthroughs in this front? I'm, I mean, you know, if anybody had a big and exciting Monday, perhaps the biggest and most exciting Monday of his life, it was Satya Nadella, the CEO of Microsoft, right, poured $13 billion into OpenAI just to be able to be partners with them, right? The fact that he now, in theory, gets to absorb Sam Altman and conceivably hundreds of his people basically for free is one of the greatest corporate coups in history if it really comes to pass. Now, it could be, because this story keeps changing hour by hour, that, you know, maybe Sam Altman does somehow go back to open AI now that they, the company there has revolted essentially against its board. So this is not necessarily a done deal that he's going to Microsoft. But if he does, okay. my gosh, that's the biggest win ever. I mean, the day he was fired, $10 billion came off of Microsoft's books when it came to the stock valuation. Today, Microsoft has the top stock valuation in its history as a company. Satya Nadella is very, very excited here, Hallie. That's, that's bonkers. Just a quick one, Jake, for people like me, me maybe not you, but me, me and people like me who just maybe use ChatGPT recreationally, are we going to notice any difference here? Or is this, is this all just sort of high-level boardroom stuff? I think you could have not read the news at all, and it'll, it'll all still be functioning exactly the same. But what it also means is that OpenAI may not be the provider of that kind of thing in future. It could be that just the biggest names in tech, Microsoft, Alphabet, Google, remain the biggest names in AI in future. And a company like OpenAI, will it survive something like this? We just don't know. Jake Ward, thank you very much for that breakdown. Appreciate it. Coming up here, a lot more to get to here in the show, including looking ahead to what happens not too long from now. Taylor Swift's concert in Brazil tonight. It'll look a little different after a fan died Friday during some record heat. We'll tell you what they're doing new tonight to make sure that people stay safer next. Plus, what Max, the streaming service, is doing temporarily to try to get more subscribers. So Taylor Swift is set to take the stage pretty soon in Brazil and with some new additional precautions after, as you probably heard, a fan died Friday night in a heat wave scorching Rio at one of her concerts. Now, listen, it is not nearly as hot tonight. It's about 75 degrees. Plus, there are some new rules in place. You can bring water bottles inside the venue. There's going to be more places to be able to get water, more security, more ambulances, for example, tonight. When that fan died on Friday night, the feel-like temps, the heat index, was 138 degrees in Rio. That's the highest heat index ever in that city on record. Fans reported not being able to bring their own water into the stadium, and Swift was seen a lot throughout the concert, stopping to make sure people had something to drink. Watch this. So when somebody says they need water when it's this hot, they really need it. 
you see this? Do you see it? Are we good? At one point, she threw a water bottle herself to somebody in the crowd. And then there are points, there she is, and there are points in the video where she's she, she's sort of like breathing heavily here. You can see her turn around and kind of take some really deep breaths, presumably trying to catch her breath herself because of how hot it was. I want to bring in Emily Aketter for more. So here we go. This concert now is tonight. It was postponed from over the weekend after that fan's death. Um, and Taylor Swift has come out, I think it was on Instagram, talking about this. And importantly, there are some real questions about accountability with this venue, given that heat wave. Talk us through what's different tonight and where this goes. Yeah, absolutely, Hallie. Good to be with you. I mean, you think about it, and this was a, seriously a tragic and stunning turn of events for what so often has been a highlight for fans of the superstar, this concert that has been quite difficult for people to get to. Fortunately, as you mentioned, tonight's forecast should offer some relief, especially when you compare it to the conditions that the fans experienced on Friday. That feels like temperature around 138 degrees. We heard from a number of different fans telling NBC News, describing the song like condition saying they could see other people passing out some people's people were shaking because of the conditions and the heat inside um, just just some terrifying and really difficult conditions for an hours long concert even the video you saw earlier you could see Taylor Swift mid song passing out water directing where water should be in the concert venue and now we're learning 23 year old Ana Clara Benavidez Machado tragically died according to event organizers she fell ill at the concert and then later died at the hospital and so now in the meantime we don't know the exact cause of death as we're waiting for the autopsy results but we're hearing government officials fans uh, the father demanding accountability he wants to know if in fact fans really were prohibited from bringing water on such a hot day into the stadium uh, we did reach out to the Brazilian event company we did not hear back for comment but in the meantime Taylor Swift posting on Instagram her heartbreak her devastation saying she was so incredibly beautiful and far too young we're Referring to Anna Clara, I feel this loss deeply and my heart bro and my broken heart goes out to her family and friends. Last night, one of her surprise song selections, she changes up a few songs each concert. It was a heartbreaking one that many think was a tribute to Anna Clara. Take a listen here. Really just a, a beautiful song there. The final concert in Rio will begin in just a few short hours. As you mentioned, Tally, there will be changes. Now fans uh, ordered by government officials uh, are allowed to bring water inside. There will be more ambulances and water stations inside. Fortunately, though, we're not going to be seeing quite extreme temperatures and record-breaking temperatures that we saw on Friday, Hallie. Emily Aketa, thank you very much for that. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, the family of Dexter Wade holding a funeral today in Mississippi for the 37-year-old. Remember, we've been telling you about Wade, who was run over by police and then buried without his family knowing about it. His mom didn't even find out what happened until months after it. You see their attorney, Benjamin Crump, has gotten involved. The family is asking the Department of Justice to investigate now in a story that NBC News began covering last month. Number two, a federal appeals court saying today that private citizens and groups cannot sue under a key part of the Voting Rights Act, something that experts say pretty much guts the Voting, right Act, Voting Rights Act in seven states. It means only the federal government would have the right to sue. This whole thing is probably headed to the Supreme Court, which means we may see another Voting Rights Act showdown at the nation's highest court next term. Number three, if you can't smell things the same way after getting COVID, there may be a fix for you. New research finds that a procedure used for chronic pain can be kind of effective in improving people's sense of smell. It involves injecting an anesthetic into your neck, which delivers signals to other parts of the body, and then apparently that's supposed to help. Number four, the winner of the Miss Universe competition for the first time ever, Miss Nicaragua. She's 23, she says she wants to work to promote mental health after having bad anxiety herself. Number five, Max, the streaming service by HBO, is lowering its subscription price ahead of Black Friday. For the next week, anybody who's new and even returning Max subscribers, you can sign up to get the no ad service for three bucks a month. Normally, it's like closer to 10 bucks. It's a deal that'll last for six months. When we come back, former First Lady Rosalind Carter being remembered all across the country tonight. We're talking about her legacy live from the Carter Center and what she's done on the issue of mental health coming up next. Plus, a tornado touching down someplace super rare in a moment caught on camera. We're going to show you in just a sec. Look at that.
NBC News covers hundreds of stories every day, and because it can be tough to read or watch or listen to them all, our bureau teams have done it for you. This is what the TELUS is going down in their regions in a segment we call The Local. Out of our Western Bureau, a small town in Arizona is cleaning up after a tornado touchdown. Look at that. This is the strongest tornado to hit Arizona in November since the 90s. At one point, it was going like 100 miles an hour. It badly damaged some of these houses. You see them here. But as far as we know, fortunately and amazingly, nobody was hurt. Also out of our Western Bureau, the L.A. freeway that partially collapsed is reopened just in time for today's morning rush hour. That's right after that arson we told you about. It was shut down for more than a week. Officials say it is safe now after emergency repairs. And out of our Midwest Bureau, this book was just returned to a Minnesota library. Typically not news that a book gets returned. This one is newsy because it was borrowed more than 100 years ago. <laughs> it was last taken out in 1919. Somebody was going through a family member's stuff. This book shows up. Of course, they go, be a good Samaritan. They go to turn it back into the library. If you're worried about a fine, the mayor says no fine for that book. Good news there. Take it down to Georgia tonight because of the Carter Center and Presidential Library, a memorial paying respect to former First Lady Rosalind Carter, who died at 96 years old just a couple days after entering hospice care. The wife of former President Jimmy Carter, leaving a legacy going well beyond the White House. She was a humanitarian, a mental health activist, with so many people now looking ahead to her funeral services, set to take place next week. I want to bring in Blaine Alexander, who's joining us now. Tell us more about the way that Rosalind Carter is being remembered today, because as we alluded to, she did a lot of work on mental health initiatives, humanitarian initiatives, and especially on the issue of mental health. Before that was something that a lot of people felt comfortable talking about publicly. You're absolutely right, Hallie. That is certainly a large part of her legacy, a way that so many people are remembering her today. But they really are remembering her for her multifaceted contributions. You know, of course, she was a beloved mother. And you can't talk about Rosalind Carter without talking about the love story that she shared with the former president. We'll get into that as well. But yes, when you talk about her as a fierce humanitarian, we're talking about somebody who truly molded the office of First Lady into her own. And not just the four years that she was in the White House, but also afterwards. Remember, she and the former president were in the White House for four years. The Carter Center has been around for more than 40 years. So when you talk about their legacy, when you talk about her legacy, certainly the center is a big part of it. In her own words, in fact, she talked about the impact that she hopes she leaves behind. And so much of it had to do with mental health advocacy. Take a look. I hope my legacy continues I mean, more than just First Lady. Because Carter Center has been an integral part of our lives, I would think, and our motto is waging peace, fighting disease, and building hope. And um, I hope that I have contributed something to mental health uh, issues and help improve a little bit people, the lives of people living with mental illnesses. And I think, Hallie, she would be so touched to know that inside there is a book inside the Carter Center where people can come and leave remembrances or tributes. I was flipping through it earlier today and I saw names from around the country, including Florida, Chicago. But one person at least specifically thanked her for her help on the mental health issue, Hallie. You talked about and just pulling this thread a little bit, Lane, because I, you know, I, I know obviously living in Washington, having covered the White House. Um, the, the love story between Jimmy Carter and Rosalind Carter is just epic, right? I mean, it's just it's just incredibly beautiful. They, they appeared back in September, and it was sort of a surprise to people to see them at um, the, peanut, the Peanut Festival. People didn't think that, that Jimmy would show up, former President Carter. Yeah, you know... Absolutely. You talk about the fact that this was an epic love story. It's also one that's unmatched by American history. We're talking about 77 years of marriage. That's longer than any other first couple in the country's history. And really, it goes back beyond that, Hallie. They grew up as next door neighbors to each other down in Plains, Georgia. They've known each other since forever and really have been lifelong partners. It's something that when I spoke to the CEO of the Carter Center here earlier today, Paige Alexander, she underscored that. She talked about their love being on full display here during their work. Here's what she had to say. They would, they would be seen walking from their apartment down to the workout room, holding hands in the middle of the day. Uh, they really, they complimented each other. They could finish each other's sentences. Uh, she would always say that, you know, she was just standing by Jimmy, but he was very quick to say that she was really his most astute political operative. And there are going to be three days worth of remembrances for the former first lady Monday through Wednesday, of course, here in Atlanta for part of it, and then culminating down in her beloved Plains, Georgia, where she'll be laid to rest, Hallie. Blaine Alexander, thank you so much.
Let's take you overseas now because tonight the rest of the world is coming to terms with the brand new Argentinian president-elect just voted into office. A libertarian and former TV talking head described as Trump-esque with four cloned dogs reportedly set to take a spiritual trip here to the U.S. and other places before his inauguration next month. As we lay out in tonight's breakdown with Argentina's economy in meltdown mode, and Javier Millet promising to carve up government. Other leaders are now watching and waiting to see what happens to one of the biggest countries in South America. This man, newly elected as the next president of Argentina. So why is he waving around a chainsaw? His name is Javier Millet. The chainsaw, a symbol of how he plans to carve up Argentina's government and its economy in the middle of its worst economic crisis in decades. Porque hoy comienza la reconstrucción de Argentina. Millet's victory, unprecedented since he's the first libertarian head of state ever elected and one of the rare third party winners in a two party system. Entonces, ¿sabes lo que pasa? Que vos desde la poltrona like another TV celebrity turned president, Millet made himself a household name on TV. Sound familiar? A celebrity on shows in Argentina, known for his outbursts against the ruling class, and who's also made headlines for his five clone dogs, describing them as his best strategists. He was elected to Argentina's Congress just two years ago, describing himself as an anarcho-capitalist. With inflation spiking and prices doubling in the last year in Argentina, Millet wants to get rid of the central bank, eliminate most business regulations, and replace the peso with the U.S. dollar. Remember that chainsaw? He wants to chop entire government departments. Ministerio de Cultura, afuera. Ministerio de Ambiente y Desarrollo Sostenible, afuera. Ministerio de las Mujeres y Género y Diversidad, afuera. The drama drawing crowds at rallies. Some people dressed in elaborate chainsaw costumes. One person even getting Millet's name tattooed on their wrist. His loyal supporters thrilled he's taking office. I support Javier Millet because I need a change. I want a change for my country that I deeply love. And we've been suffering many years of decadence. I'm very happy. I'm happy to see Argentina didn't get lost in Massa's populism and all this disgusting progressivism that doesn't work anymore. But Millet remains controversial. Not everyone on board. I personally didn't vote for him because I felt like it was a leap into the void. God willing, he surprises us. So, a huge upset. Again, remind you of anybody here in this country back in 2016? But as a political outsider, Millet is probably going to need to make some compromises with members of Congress, according to Argentinians, to try to get anything done. We're watching to see how he navigates that. Coming up here on the show, some new research suggests a certain type of belly fat could be linked to Alzheimer's. Why even losing the fat may not cut your risk. So a new study out tonight finds a specific type of belly fat could be linked to more of a risk for developing Alzheimer's. We're talking about deep belly fat. It's called visceral fat. It actually builds up around your organs. It's not always actually visible. It can sometimes take an MRI scan to confirm whether you have it or not. Dr. Kavita Patel joins us now. And that is an important point here, right? Because whether somebody is in a larger body or a smaller body, they could still have this internal fat around their organs. And that actually can, can change up the way your brain works. Explain that. Yeah, and it's hard. Some people are asking, how do I know if I've got this yeah. fat? You do need an MRI. But short of an MRI, what we usually see is that your waist is bigger than your hips. So you can oh. even see that. So you can be skinny and kind of have like a bigger waist than your hips. And then usually in people with visceral fat, we see prediabetes or diabetes or insulin resistance. So draw a line to us from this kind of fat between what it does that and what it does to your brain yeah here. yeah and and this study was small so i don't want to make these huge leaps like people with this kind of very fat good thank this you thing. yes however what it points to is this growing body of evidence that this kind of fat and it's the, not the under the skin fat it's like you said around the organs points to a lot of inflammation that inflammation and some of the brain changes we see with it point to early signs of alzheimer's or things that look like they could become alzheimer's even 15 years down the line. They also show some significant brain changes around relays of communication. So sometimes we talk about people not being able to respond as quickly, right. having word finding problems. Some of that could start with these signals, inflammation in your body and that fat around your organs. So then how does one decrease inflammation if yeah. you're at risk for it, right? Because that, that seems to be the question. Right. This isn't about, oh, I need to like 
quote unquote, go on a quote unquote diet or whatever, right? right? right. Like this is something different. So it's definitely something different. And, and remember in the context of Alzheimer's, millions of people that have Alzheimer's were also trying to figure out all the other diseases that could be associated with this. So it does start with the basics. It's things that decrease inflammation, which diet does play a critical role in. But Hallie, what'll surprise people is that you don't have to really change your diet radically. It's just making these swaps, a little more plant-based foods, mm. some vegetables, some fruits, all the things we talk about, not drastic things. And then I think exercise and a lot of people ask me how much exercise, even 30 minutes of a brisk walk every day. So everybody can try to find 10 minute chunks. Brisk walking can decrease that visceral fat and that inflammation in your body. Dr. Kavita Patel, thank you very thank much you. for that. Good to see you. Still to come here on the show, a lot more to get to, including the holiday season, which means holiday shopping. But some experts are now sounding the alarm that many scams are more sophisticated than ever before. We're getting into it next. As we hit the season of gratitude and giving, we are also hitting the season for taking with scammers making merry left and right. And this year, new concern that they're taking holiday fraud high tech. Here's Noah Pransky with more. Avoiding shopping scams used to be so simple. Watch out for pickpocketers. Don't send money online to strangers. If an email looks fake, it probably is. But in 2023, the scams are a lot more sophisticated than you may have realized. These are organized criminal gangs, often located overseas, who are very savvy at what they do. John Brio with the National Consumer League has been tracking really convincing websites, product reviews, shipping alerts, all fake. Basically, these aren't the same old Nigerian email scams. Just ask a former Nigerian scammer. It's, it's getting so sophisticated now. They're becoming smart every day. Chris Maxwell, zooming in from the middle of the night in Nigeria, is a reformed scammer now consulting for the site socialcatfish.com. He says scammers aren't just looking for a quick payday these days. They want a gift that keeps on giving. Just one of your major passwords. Since so many of us reuse them across multiple accounts. Once you have access to the password, you have access to their social security number, you have access to their driver's license, you have access to your credit cards, you have access to their bank accounts. Very easy to do a lot of damage with information like that. So here are five quick tips to defend yourself against 2023's most dangerous thieves and hackers. Number one, don't reuse passwords. I know it's impossible to remember 300 different logins, but at least use different passwords for your bank and email. Consider using a secure password manager to make it all easier. And always use two-factor authentication for those really important accounts. Number two, look out for shipping scams. Get an email or text about a delayed delivery? Don't click, don't respond, don't call the number. To avoid a trap, get your updates from the retailer or the shipper's sites. Tip number three, you may think I'm nuts here, but update your software. About four in 10 Americans hammer that remind me later button when prompted to patch up vulnerabilities and it's music to hackers ears. Well, this is me reminding you later, update your phone and your software. Tip number four, pay with a credit card. They have much better protections than most of the new digital payments scammers prefer. Bitcoin, gift card, cash app, PayPal, Venmo, Zelle. If they ask you to pay a risky way, run away. You pay, pay the safest way. That's with a credit card for most people. And tip number five, beware of really convincing online websites you've never heard of. Even Black Friday deals have their limits. Listen to your gut. If it looks too good to be true, it probably is. With any luck, your vigilance will ensure some happy holidays, at least until those credit card bills roll in come January. I don't know, Noah saw a good ad for a new TV for 10 bucks. Are you telling me that could be fake? <laughs> Go to the store, wait overnight and do it in person, Allie. <laughs> Here's the thing that's so interesting though, um, AI, right? Stuff that's like deep fake scams. Like they, they, this is, a, in some ways, this new tech means a new realm or a new world of fraud that we have to watch for, right? Yeah, and the watchdogs say this is really just the beginning of that wave. Um, the deepfake stuff is scary. The the audio, the visuals of seeing someone you think is someone you know, that's scary. 
but they're also really concerned about the fact that they can use these text-based traps, use AI to, to perfect them, and, and really just go large scale with these traps. So instead of having to do, you know, potential victims one by one, they do hundreds or thousands at a time, all automated. So there's a lot of concern. The best advice is for you and your family, have a safe word. So if someone who looks and sounds like you reaches out to your family and you want to be sure, there at least is some way for you to communicate secretly between each other to know if this is a real problem, a real, you know, uh, a real emergency yeah. and those kind of things. So, Hallie, one piece of advice on top of those five quick ones you gave you as well. Noah Pransky, thank you. Appreciate it. That does it for us for this hour. We've got a lot more coverage picking up right now. on the air tonight with what may be the closest we've ever been to a hostage deal between Israel and Hamas. Why the president is literally crossing his fingers, even as fighting's getting worse around Gaza's hospitals. We're live in the region as our team gets rare access to Israeli military operations. Plus, double trouble in the sky. Tons of people, tons of bad weather, including at least one confirmed tornado tonight. Maybe a recipe for disaster just days before Thanksgiving. What you should know about this potentially record-setting holiday travel week. And President Biden turning 81, but a not so fun surprise he's getting pretty low new approval rating. Why the White House says it's not so worried, at least right now. Plus, why a new gig for the former head of OpenAI has the tech world freaking out. The stakes for Sam Altman and all the rest of us who use or think about ChatGPT in a couple of minutes. Plus, Taylor Swift's back on the stage in Brazil tonight after one of her fans died during a heat wave hit in Rio. We'll tell you the new precautions that are being taken now to make sure folks stay safe coming up later in the show. Hey there, I'm Hallie. And tonight, a deal to get some of the hostages held captive by Hamas freed. Looks like it could be closer than ever to actually coming through, according to the White House. With President Biden offering up a bit of a glimmer of hope today. Watch. Is it hostage deal near? You see the president there holding up his crossed fingers for the 200 plus people kidnapped by Hamas terrorists back on October 7th. As this news of a potential, a potential release coming as we're seeing a lot of fighting around another hospital in northern Gaza as the Israeli military expands its ground attacks. We're talking about the Indonesian hospital where eyewitnesses report bombing and gunshots and artillery strikes. The World Health Organization says they don't know how the 700 people inside are doing because they cannot reach them. Israel says its troops, in their words, directly targeted the specific source of enemy fire. The Indonesian foreign minister condemning the attack, which Hamas says has killed at least 12 people. Then at a different hospital in Gaza, Al-Shifa, you have hundreds of patients still trapped inside, but not about 30 premature babies. That's because they've been evacuated in the last 24 hours. Tonight we're learning they're... They're in Egypt. They have arrived in Egypt, some of them taken to the ICU. Israel is putting out new video today claiming to show hostages and tunnels inside and under that hospital, Al-Shifa, with one of the videos showing what Israel says are hostages getting forced inside Al-Shifa on the morning of the terror attack last month. We've got to be clear here. NBC News cannot confirm when those videos you just saw were taken or who's actually in them. All of it is happening as our own Keir Simmons is getting rare access to Israeli military operations at a base just north of Gaza, giving some new clues on where this war could go next. I want to bring in our reporters who are live on the ground for us, both Raf Sanchez and Keir Simmons in Tel Aviv. Raf, let me start with you on the hostages here. A deal has not been reached yet, right? I mean, that really is the biggest headline as we're coming on the air with so many question marks about what could be in it. How close are we? What do we know and what do we not know about the contours of what any agreement would look like? So, Ali, just a couple of minutes ago, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu wrapped up a meeting with the families of the hostages. It happened a couple of miles from where I am at the Defense Ministry here in Tel Aviv. He said that he shared with them as much political, military and intelligence information as he could without jeopardizing the deal. But he really didn't go into any details. And many of the families emerged from that meeting very frustrated. Here's what we know based on talking to our sources. The broad outlines of this deal is that Hamas releases some, but crucially not all, of the hostages in exchange for a pause in the fighting in Gaza. We don't know how many are being talked about. It sounds 
like it's likely to be in the several dozen out of the 240 in total. We think it's likely to be the women and children who will be released first. We don't know how many days of ceasefire, but it may be that these hostages are released in a staggered fashion, a certain number each day for each day of the ceasefire. What we don't know at this point, Hallie, is what else Israel has agreed. It's possible that Israel may have agreed to release Palestinian prisoners from jails in this country as part of this overall exchange. That's something that we've seen happen in the past. Back in 2011, Israel released hundreds of Palestinians in return for a single Israeli soldier being held by Hamas. But, Hallie, we cannot underscore enough. Our sources are telling us, the White House is saying on the record, nothing is agreed until everything is agreed and nothing is finalized right now. Alex. So does this mean, Raph, I mean, I'm looking, I know it's the middle of the night where you are. Does this mean that news could come on a dime? In other words, that the prime minister could come out at any point and make some kind of announcement or we could start to hear from sources at any point that something is moving here? It's possible, Hallie. I'll tell you one of the many complicating factors here is that the communications in Gaza are so poor. Uh, so you are having this multi-party negotiation, which includes the leader of Hamas, leaders of Hamas, many of whom are in tunnels underneath Gaza City, underneath somewhere else in the Strip, limited communications, their ability to communicate back to Qatar about whether or not they accept that deal is very complicated. So possible. Anything is possible. But that is one of the many complications. Alex. It's such a great point, Raph. It's such an important one. Can you quickly, before we let you go, we mentioned uh, you and I have been talking a lot in the last week or so about those um, those premature babies uh, who have become in so many ways a symbol of the, the worst of this war, the innocent lives at risk. They have now, I, I believe it's nearly 30 of them, Raph, right, getting to Egypt today. What else do we know? So 28 of them crossed from Gaza into Egypt today. Uh, Halle, Egyptian officials say that they were especially concerned about 12 of them uh, who have been flown to Cairo for intensive care there. These are little children younger than this war who have had the most brutal possible start to life uh, in incubators in a hospital that ran out of power, ran out of water, ran out of food. They could not have had it more difficult. Um, and the whole world is hoping and praying that these 28 pull through. Uh, at least eight of them did die inside of Gaza, Halle. Um, so all hopes now invested in those who survived who are in Egypt. Raf Sanchez, live for us in Tel Aviv. Raf, thank you so much. Here, I want to go to you now here because you had some access here to some of these Israeli military operators who are in charge of the aerial attacks in Gaza. Talk to us about what you're learning and where this fighting could go next. What clues you got from this? Well, we went to see them at not far from Tel Aviv uh, here. Uh, they couldn't be identified because of the nature of their work. It's uh, Israeli Defense Force policy not to identify them. Uh, they're pretty young, I would say, in their 20s, honestly. One of them told me that a friend is actually among those who's been kidnapped, and yet at the same time they're doing this job, if you want to call it that, of uh, this controversial job of piloting drones that are targeting the area around Gaza and beyond. Take a list of what one's on. Are there moments in this process where you realize you've accidentally hit a civilian and, and what impact does that have on you? I could say that war is messy and we can train all day and all night not to hit civilians. But when Hamas trains all day and night so that we do hit civilians, sometimes they have the upper hand. When it happens, we as IDF soldiers take it very hardly, understanding that we'll have to be better next time and more precise, and that's what we train to do. More precise, uh, Halle, uh, it's thought, widely thought that these drones are more specific, more targeted than other kinds of bombs, if you like. It is relentless. You could hear a drone flying over us just when uh, he was talking there. But again, it is still controversial uh, legally and for many people ethically. So uh, this is a role that is new in the world, I guess you would say, uh, and one that not everybody agrees with.
In addition to what you've been covering now for over a month, Kira, which is obviously this war between Israel and Hamas in Gaza, there is the discussion um, and, and one thing that we should talk about, which is the West Bank, right? And this is another area, I think we have a map we can put up to show people. Um, and things seem to be developing there as well. One of Israel's drone strikes happened there at least, right? And you visited there. Yeah, I, well, the West Bank is is incredibly tense and has been particularly since the October 7th terror attacks. But yeah, we went to the West Bank and we went there because uh, we uh, heard there was a drone strike there uh, on Friday night. And we were there on Saturday to see the funeral of five people, local people say. Now, one, both the Israelis and local people agree, uh, was the, the leader of the armed wing of uh, the Fatah movement, the Al-Aqsa Martyrs uh, Brigade and described as a terrorist by the Israelis. Both sides say that's the case. But on the other hand, a 15-year-old was also in, the, in a building where that drone targeted uh, and also someone walking past on the street. And it just goes to the point. Another aspect of this, uh, Halley, when we went there to see this funeral, uh, there was a sense of the community enraged, angry. Uh, and again, that's going to raise questions for people about whether or not, despite these drone strikes allegedly being more targeted, whether what impact they actually have in, in a place. Uh, whether, in fact, they, they help uh, tackle extremism or fuel it. Kier Simmons, live for us in Tel Aviv. Kier, we're grateful to you for all of your reporting. We want to point out to people that there will be more tonight on NBC Nightly News. Kier's interview, Kier's reporting at 6.30 Eastern with Lester Holt. You can watch it wherever you watch your local NBC station. Let's bring you back here to home now because tonight a potentially nightmarish collision of super busy travel and super bad weather in some of the country setting off alarm bells ahead of what could be a record-setting Thanksgiving travel week. You've got a tornado watch in effect right now. You see it here for some folks down south. One tornado has already been confirmed in Louisiana. Something like 10 million people are at the risk of severe thunderstorms, which, you know, not great for airlines. Take a live look right here. Travelers heading into LAX, planes waiting in Philly. Some 30 million of us are expected to fly somewhere this holiday. So, okay, lots of people, lots of bad weather. Not the world's best Thanksgiving recipe. Here's Tran uh, Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg going one on one with our own Tom Costello on this. We've got people literally working around the clock and across the country on aviation safety. We're going to continue that and accelerate it. Meteorologist Bill Karens is standing by with the latest forecast, but I want to get to Morgan Chesky, who is posted up doing his travel week duty in Dallas. Morgan, it seems like there's a lot of folks who want to get a jump on some of this. There's also the factor that people can go early. You can leave Monday because with more people remote working, you can be somewhere else, right? Even if it is, if it is a weekday. Are you seeing some of the impact where you are? Right. Uh, Hallie, absolutely. And it is a wild concept coming out of the pandemic when no one was traveling. Now we're seeing these numbers start to tick up and we're seeing people take advantage of this new situation that they have employment wise. You nailed it. We have seen steady streams of travelers come through here at Dallas Love Airport today trying to get ahead on the holiday crowds, which really won't peak ahead of Thanksgiving until the next two days, Tuesday and Wednesday expected to have the biggest surge of travelers flying. And then on this upcoming Sunday, as everyone goes back home. There you go. Mark those dates on your calendar. Uh, if you haven't already started your journey, uh, the options are limited if you don't want to compete with the crowds. And that is why here at Dallas Love and other airports, they are increasing staffing here at Dallas Love. They're encouraging people to call a hotline so they can figure out where exactly parking is available. Uh, similar to other uh, steps being taken across uh, the country by other airports as everyone's just trying to alleviate that travel stress, right, and save time uh, because everyone's short on that with so many people traveling. And here's what some travelers were doing in Florida, which, by the way, has three of the top domestic destinations this holiday season. Take a listen. We get out on a Monday and we come right back after before the crowds come. Getting here really was not a problem at all. If I hear that they're having problems, I go earlier. 
course, all of those individuals are travel overachievers, you could say. The TSA says expect many more people to come through. I know in Dallas alone on Wednesday, Hallie, they're expecting about 45,000 or so travelers. On a typical Wednesday, about 10,000. So quadruple <laughs> the numbers there. TSA stressing to everyone, if you are traveling with something to bring to that holiday meal and you don't want to be the one holding up the security line, if you can spray it or spread it, you probably need to check it. However, if you do want to carry a turkey, some stuffing, some macaroni and cheese or any of the sides, you can carry that on. So a word to the wise for anyone trying to save a little time uh, when they hit the airport this holiday season. If you can spray it or spread it, you should check it. I mean, that is, listen, that's, that's an interesting new thing for me. And I travel, I am a travel overachiever and I've never checked a turkey um, or carried one on, I guess. Morgan Chesky, appreciate you. Thank you very much. Spray and meteorologist Bill Karens. Bill, um, I, don't, I don't know if you're carrying stuffing through a TSA checkpoint, but I know you're watching what's going down weather-wise, which could <laughs> well, be problematic, perhaps more than that. So I've been listening to Morgan all day. And like, all I can think of is that if I'm on some three-hour flight, I'm starving, and I'm, get, I'm eating like peanuts, and the person totally. next to me has like some casserole or something that's just like smells delicious i mean yes you're sharing Can right you share? i mean you're yes. breaking it out thanksgiving on the plane uh yeah so let's get into the serious stuff with the tornado so we don't want cleanup for thanksgiving yes you're going to have to clean up after the meal and everything else but we don't want to have to clean up from damaging storms and that's what's potentially happening now through about the next couple hours i'd love to get past this unscathed with no big damage we do have two active tornado warnings a couple severe thunderstorm warnings so far we've hadn't had any reports of any damage we have minimal power outages too because that's great we don't need line crews out there working over the holidays let alone people in the dark too so in natchez mississippi right along the mississippi river here this purple shading here really intense thunderstorm just to your north possible rotation and with that and a possible tornado and that would be heading up towards the northeast so again this is now into mississippi that we're tracking some of the really dangerous storms tomorrow isolated severe not like the threat we have going on right now in mississippi and areas of louisiana we will have have airport problems, especially in the afternoon. The morning, more as we go towards Atlanta, uh, Tallahassee, possibly Nashville. But in the afternoon hours tomorrow in the evening, if you can avoid traveling on the East Coast, you know, you can put it off a day. I know Wednesday's a really busy day, but that may save you from getting caught on the roads and also sitting at the airport for hours because we're not going to have so many cancellations. But when these thunderstorms go through, we'll have ground stops, and that's just going to delay everything throughout the day. So that includes Charlotte, Atlanta. More or less heavy rain, Washington, D.C., Baltimore, BMI, heading into Philly, New York late tomorrow evening. All major airports could rain about one to two inches in New York City. And of course, anyone driving on 995, you know, it's going to be driving in the rain. It'll be slow. It's not snow or ice, thankfully. Only our friends in northern New England will have to deal with that. That's Tuesday night into Wednesday morning. Anyone driving up through the White and the Green Mountains, the Adirondacks, you will be dealing with some wintry precept driving. Uh, mostly through the Appalachians, 81 should be just fine, just rainy weather. By the time anyone's traveling and maybe just doing some local driving on Thursday for Thanksgiving, not bad. Uh, just some showers left over in the Gulf Coast. Anyone in our friends in Wyoming and Idaho, you will have some issues with some snow and wind. That'll become more widespread as we go into Friday. Denver to Cheyenne, especially heading out into the plains there, especially in Nebraska. East Coast uh, for shopping plans, fun outdoor plans, anything you want to do. The weather looks great. Saturday, same east of the Mississippi, no problems. West Coast is good. Not a, The storm kind of dies off a little bit by the time we get to Saturday. And then by Sunday for the really busy day when everyone's traveling back home or back to school, not bad at all. So uh, tonight, tomorrow, the worst of it, Hallie. After that, we should be okay. Bill Karens, thank you. Appreciate it. Okay. You too. Got some new reaction from the White House tonight as President Biden celebrates his 81st birthday with a traditional turkey pardon. It's not 81, however, but another number getting a lot of attention tonight, 40. That's because that is his approval rating. You see it there, the lowest of his term so far, a number driven partly by how voters feel about his handling of the Israel-Hamas war and how they feel about how old he is, partly. As every day, this president sets a new record for the oldest person to ever serve in the White House as president. Gabe Gutierrez is joining us now. So, Gabe, talk us through where some of these numbers are landing, especially on a day like this, right? Our new NBC News poll coming out just a day before President Biden turns 81, which is today. Um, 
When I talk to Democrats, uh, de depending sort of where they are in the Democratic spectrum, some of Biden allies will say things like, well, listen, people aren't paying attention yet. Like, once we start to frame a one on one matchup, if it is Donald Trump, some of these numbers will shift. I think there are other Democrats that I talk to who, who suggest that they do have some concerns about the age thing, the age thing, quote unquote. Yeah. But they also acknowledge, yeah. what can you do about it? Like, yeah, that, that's it is right, what it Allie. is. Look. Exactly. And, you know, Karine Jean-Pierre said as much uh, pretty much today that they're not going to be able to change anybody, uh, everyone's mind. And we'll hear from her in just a second. But this is something that Democrats uh, are talking about. It. And when you do talk to Democrats, they say, look, um, we're almost a year out. Uh, we're still a year out from the election and things will change. But look at some of these NBC News uh, polling numbers that we're getting. And they consider that age is a major or moderate concern for a large swath of the American public right now. If you're looking at this, 74 percent of respondents to this poll list uh, President Biden's age and fitness as a major or moderate concern. 62 percent uh, list uh, former President Trump's multiple criminal and civil trials. 60 percent uh, mention uh, President Biden's awareness of his son Hunter Biden's business dealings. And just 47 percent list former President Trump's age and fitness as a major or moderate concern. Again, former President Trump just a few years younger than President Biden, as you well know, Hallie. But the Biden administration would much prefer Americans pay attention to what they see as an improving economic outlook. Uh, uh, they want uh, people to be focused on cooling inflation and the fact that, you know, uh, people's Thanksgiving dinner might cost less this year than it did last year. But as you just saw in that poll, the president's age is still top of mind, Hallie. It's also foreign policy, at least lately, because some of these new polling numbers show that the um, handling of the Israel-Hamas war is not winning over particularly younger Democratic voters, Gabe. Yeah, that's exactly right as well. If you look at those numbers with young voters, especially those 18 to 34, take a look at that. 70 percent of those voters ages 18 to 34 disapprove of President Biden's handling of the Israel-Hamas war. And that could point to major concerns as we head to 2024. Now, as I mentioned, Karine Jean-Pierre, the White House press secretary, was asked about these polling numbers. For the most part, she did as she usually does. She dismissed those polling numbers. But when pressed about about those concerns about President Biden's age. Take a listen to what she said. We're not going to change the minds of Americans. I get that. Americans are going to feel how they feel, and we're going to respect that. We believe experience, this president having experience to get things done is important. And Hallie, today here at the White House, as you mentioned, the president pardoned two turkeys, Liberty and Bell. During his speech, he also mistook uh, Taylor Swift and uh, Britney Spears, perhaps not uh, helping him with some of those younger voters, Hallie. Gabe Gutierrez, thank you very much. Lots to, lots to unpack on that one. Appreciate it. In other news uh, related to presidents, or at least in this instance, former presidents here in Washington, it looks like a panel of judges could keep a gag order in place, but a more narrow one against Donald Trump in his federal election interference case. This is based on some of the tea leaves during questioning today. Listen. Why does the district court have to wait and see and wait for the threats to come rather than taking a, a reasonable action in advance? Again, the standard is imminently impending, solidity of evidence. We have an inference from stuff that happened three years ago, countervailed, you know, contradicted by the evidence we actually have here, which is wall to wall. I mean, they are saying, oh, it's an imminent threat let me ask that someone you, could be harassed. And it is not asked. So right now, this gag order is on pause because judges are trying to figure out how to balance the former president's right to free speech with protections for the people who are a part of this case accusing Mr. Trump of trying to overturn the 2020 election. The whole point initially was to try to get Mr. Trump to stop threatening prosecutors or potential witnesses or court employees working on this case. Ken Delanian is joining us now. So like... Legal stuff aside, right? Like, and we don't have a decision yet. But reading the tea leaves, it seems as though this gag order will stay but be more narrow. What does that mean practically for former President Trump, who we have seen make these truth social posts, say things at rallies that are concerning to some of the people who are looking at court staff, et cetera? Right. It may mean that they find a way to craft an order that allows him to, say, continue to criticize Jack Smith, the special counsel, but not in a way that would incite a threat, potentially. I don't know what that's going to look like. Frankly, there was a lot of uh, head of a pin kinds of arguments today about what does the word target mean? And, mm. you know, and, and you, you heard. Yeah, how do you make that? How does that practically go into effect, though? 
unclear to me. But okay. you heard that lawyer, um, Trump's lawyer, argue that you really can't show a nexus between a lot of this inflammatory rhetoric that Trump has engaged in these attacks and threats, direct threats. Prosecutor Jack Smith's team made the opposite argument. They said, no, in fact, there's a clear record, including a death threat to the judge in this case that came after Donald Trump tweeted, you know, if you come after me, I'm going to go after you. So, but this is a real clash between two fundamental American values, you know, free speech and a presidential candidate's right to speak in a campaign and a judge's right to prevent a criminal defendant from engaging in witness tampering and jury tampering uh, and, and, and behavior that potentially puts people's lives in jeopardy. If, if this were not the particular defendant that we're talking about here, if this were not the former president of the United States, do you believe that there would be this level of intense debate and discussion about this? Or would the gag order have already been in place, done and Absolutely. I mean, okay. these, these things are standard. I, I, mm -hmm. The um, special counsel lawyer said today that this is the first case in American history where a criminal defendant has been able to broadcast to a national audience, you know, savage criticism of the prosecutor, the judge, witnesses in this case, calling them lunatic, deranged corrupt. That just doesn't happen in normal trials. When should we know which way the judges, this panel goes on this one? So they brought this on, a, they're hearing this on an expedited basis, so it could be days or weeks, and okay. almost certainly going to the Supreme Court. Um, real quick, there's also a, a gag order that the former president is fighting. Different case, yeah. New York, civil fraud trial, having to do with his business, not having to do with election interference. Does anything that happened here in D.C. affect what happens in New York, or two separate yes. things? Well, it, it's separate because it's, it's about state law, but the principles are the same. It's the constitutional principle of free speech, which was the issue raised in New York, and so they're going to pay close attention to what this appeals court says. Ken Delaney and fascinating stuff. Thank you so much. Keep us updated. I know you will. So tonight, the guy who's been changing the face of tech in this country looks like he has a new gig already after getting forced out of open AI. And now, after days of boardroom drama straight out of succession, hundreds of his open AI workers are threatening to quit over what went down on Friday. Remember, as we told you then, that's when the board shocked pretty much everybody by saying they no longer had confidence in Sam Altman, who you see here. The backlash to that sparked rumors Altman would actually come back, then he was officially out again, and now kind of rehired, it seems, by Microsoft, the CEO, saying that Altman will lead a new advanced AI research team. In just the last few minutes, the CEO of Microsoft appearing on CNBC, saying that the governance at OpenAI, or that the governance generally should probably change, even no matter where Sam Altman is. Listen. We have all the technology uh, and capability to keep innovating on the products you saw at our Ignite conference last week, uh, up and down the stack from Silicon to co-pilots, and, and, and committed to OpenAI and Sam. Committed to Sam, you hear him say. It's a huge deal, right? Because Sam Altman, in so many ways, is the face of AI technology. You know ChatGPT? Yeah, that is what we're talking about here. That's Sam Altman. That is OpenAI. Jake Ward is joining us now. I just want to go big picture for a sec and then let's go nitty gritty because it feels to me like people sure. in tech are like going bananas capital B over this. Like it is so intense. It is everyone's like, oh my, why is it such a big deal, right? CEOs come and go fairly often in Silicon Valley. Help, <clears throat> help the non-techies understand what's at stake here. Well, I think, you know, the, the big thing, right, is this fact, as you pointed out, that right, open AI is what put Jack GPT in all our lap. It is what has taught us the power of AI more broadly. And it is also one of the only companies in that space that operates in this funky kind of nonprofit way that was supposed to make it responsible, not just for making huge amounts of money, but also responsible broadly to humanity. The whole mission statement of the place, Hallie, was the idea that it would sort of hold hold back from all of the possible uses of AI in order to make the most responsible version of it. It seems that there was some sort of philosophical difference between Sam Altman and, and uh, Greg Brockman, who had been the president of the company, and the board over that issue. The board sort of intimated as much when they talked about there being a lack of, of candid communications here. They kept talking about the central premise of the company and that that was somehow the issue at stake. We're not sure what their reasons were for firing him, but one, one of the most successful tech CEOs in the history of tech is suddenly fired the day after he's giving major speeches to world leaders at APEC and uh, all over the Bay Area. He had just had a big dev day. The guy had no idea he was going to get fired and then suddenly was like that. It just is such a, a, a just a, it shakes the world. Not to mention the fact that now his company's in all-out rebellion and suddenly he's got totally. this crazy new job at Microsoft. And are all these open AI workers starting to quit? Would they come over with him to Microsoft? Like, in other words, is Microsoft now poised to make some major, major breakthroughs in this front? 
I mean, you know, if anybody had a big and exciting Monday, perhaps the biggest and most exciting Monday of his life, it was Satya Nadella, the CEO of Microsoft, right, poured $13 billion into OpenAI just to be able to be partners with them, right? The fact that he now, in theory, gets to absorb Sam Altman and conceivably hundreds of his people basically for free is one of the greatest corporate coups in history if it really comes to pass. Now, it could be, because this story keeps changing hour by hour, that, you know, maybe Sam Altman does somehow go back to open AI now that they the company there has revolted essentially against its board so this is not necessarily a done deal that he's going to Microsoft but if he does okay. my gosh that's the biggest win ever I mean the day he was fired 10 billion dollars came off of Microsoft's books when it came to the stock valuation today Microsoft has the top stock valuation in its history as a company. Satya Nadella is very, very excited here, Hallie. That's, that's bonkers. Just a quick one, Jake, for people like me, me maybe not you, but me, me and people like me who just maybe use ChatGPT recreationally, are we going to notice any difference here? Or is this, is this all just sort of high-level boardroom stuff? I think you could have not read the news at all, and it'll, it'll all still be functioning exactly the same. But what it also means is that OpenAI may not be the provider of that kind of thing in future. It could be that just the biggest names in tech, Microsoft, Alphabet, Google, remain the biggest names in AI in future. And a company like OpenAI, will it survive something like this? We just don't know. Jake Ward, thank you very much for that breakdown. Appreciate it. Coming up here on the show, football legend Joe Namath accused of allowing sex abuse at his camps with the new details just coming into us from that lawsuit. Plus, the CDC's new warning about a deadly listeria outbreak in at least seven states. That's in the five things. So Taylor Swift in just the last few minutes is hitting the stage in Brazil, but with some new and different precautions after a fan died Friday night at a show with the heat waves scorching Rio in Nelson. Tonight you're seeing what, what it'll look like outside the arena. It's not nearly as hot, not even close. It's about 75 degrees. Plus, there are some new rules in place now, like letting water bottles into the venue. You're going to have more places to get water. There's going to be more security, more ambulances. When that fan died, the feel-like temperatures, what it felt like was 138 degrees in Rio. That's the highest in heat index ever on record. Fans reported not being able to bring their own water into the stadium. And Swift was seen a bunch of times throughout the concert stopping. Like, she stopped to make sure that people had something to drink. Watch. So when somebody says they need water when it's this hot, they really need it. Do you see, this, do you see it? Are we good? At one point, she threw a bottle to somebody in the crowd, and you can see in this video, right, she's, she herself, there she is throwing the water, she herself turns around, takes some deep breaths, presumably trying to catch her breath, whew, because it was so hot, because of the heat. Emily Aketa is joining us now with more. Concert now is tonight. It was postponed from over the weekend after that fan's death. Um, and Taylor Swift has come out, I think it was on Instagram, talking about this. And importantly, there are some real questions about accountability with this venue, given that heat wave. Talk us through what's different tonight and where this goes. Yeah, absolutely, Hallie. Good to be with you. I mean, you think about it, and this was a, seriously a tragic and stunning turn of events for what so often has been a highlight for fans of the superstar, this concert that has been quite difficult for people to get to. Fortunately, as as you mentioned, tonight's forecast should offer some relief, especially when you compare it to the conditions that the fans experienced on Friday. That feels like temperature around 138 degrees. We heard from a number of different fans telling NBC News, describing the sauna-like conditions, saying they could see other people passing out. Some people's people were shaking because of the conditions and the heat inside. Um, just, just some terrifying and really difficult conditions for an hours-long concert. Even the video you saw earlier, you could see Taylor Swift mid song, passing out water, directing where water should be in the concert venue. And now we're learning 23-year-old Ana Clara Benavidez Machado tragically died. According to event organizers, she fell ill at the concert and then later died at the hospital. And so now, in the meantime, we don't know the exact cause of death as we're waiting for the autopsy results, but we're hearing government officials, fans, uh, the father demanding accountability. He wants to know if, in fact, fans really were prohibited from bringing water on such a hot day 
way into the stadium. Uh, we did reach out to the Brazilian event company. We did not hear back for comment. But in the meantime, Taylor Swift posting on Instagram her heartbreak, her devastation, saying she was so incredibly beautiful and far too young, referring to Anna Clara. I feel this loss deeply and my heart Bro and my broken heart goes out to her family and friends. Last night, one of her surprise song selections, she changes up a few songs each concert. It was a heartbreaking one that many think was a tribute to Anna Clara. Take a listen here. There will be changes. Now fans uh, ordered by government officials uh, are allowed to bring water inside. There will be more ambulances and water stations inside. Fortunately, though, we're not going to be seeing quite extreme temperatures and record-breaking temperatures that we saw on Friday, Hallie. Emily Aketa, thank you very much for that. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, a Florida man is suing New York Jets icon Joe Namath, accusing him of turning a blind eye to sex abuse at his football camp. The man says one of the football coaches there who died decades ago assaulted him when he was a minor and that Namath should have picked up on obvious warning signs. An attorney for Namath is declining to comment. Number two, a federal appeals court saying today private citizens and groups cannot sue under a key part of the Voting Rights Act, which pretty much guts the legislation in seven states. That means that only the federal government would have the right to sue. All of it means, though, that this decision is probably headed back to the Supreme Court for potentially another showdown on the Voting Rights Act. Number three, if you can't smell stuff the same after getting COVID, there may now be a solution for you involving a neck injection. New research finds that this procedure, which is sometimes used for chronic, chronic pain, can actually help improve smell for people who have lost that. You put this anesthetic into your neck, which delivers signals to other parts of the body and apparently helps. Number four, the United Auto Workers Union says its members of Ford, Stellantis, and GM have officially ratified new contracts Remember, they got those deals after striking for six weeks. Union workers, now that the I's are dotted, the T's are crossed, they're going to get an 11% pay raise right away and a 25% raise over the next four and a half years. Number five, the CD says at least one person is dead and 10 others in the hospital because of a listeria outbreak, apparently linked to peaches, nectarines, and plums, all distributed by the same company. That company recalled the fruits that were affected, so it's probably not in stores. Could still be at your home, though. If you have any of them, the CDC says throw them out right away. More details, of course, uh, on our website and on the CDC's as well. A lot more to get to when we come back, including remembering former First Lady Rosalind Carter, Carter Tonight, we're talking about her legacy live from Georgia. Just a minute. NBC News covers hundreds of international stories every day. And because it can be tough to read or watch or listen to them all, our teams around the world have done it for you. Here's some of what they're keeping an eye on in a segment we call The Global. Out of Ukraine, the defense secretary. Secretary Lloyd Austin, you see him making the surprise visit to Kyiv today to meet with the Ukrainian president, Volodymyr Zelensky, reassuring him that the U.S. will support Ukraine, in his words, for the long haul. Austin says the U.S. will send Ukraine another $100 million worth of weapons. Out of Spain, Shakira coming to a deal with prosecutors on the first day of her tax fraud trial. She'll pay a fine of around $8 million. She'll get a suspended three-year sentence, but she will not go to prison. And out of France, take a look, this hat right here. That's one of the ones Napoleon wore when he ruled France. It just sold for just over $2 million at auction. It's only one of a handful of Napoleon's hats left. Tonight, take it down to Georgia because of the Carter Center and Presidential Library, a memorial paying respect to former First Lady Rosalind Carter, who died at 96 years old just days after entering hospice care. The wife of former President Jimmy Carter, leaving behind a legacy that went well beyond the White House as a humanitarian and mental health activist. Her funeral services set to take place next week. Blaine Alexander is joining us now. Tell us more about the way that Rosalind Carter is being remembered today, because as we alluded to, she did a lot of work on mental health initiatives, humanitarian initiatives, and especially on the issue of mental health. Before that was something that a lot of people felt comfortable talking about publicly. You're absolutely right, Hallie. That is certainly a large part of her legacy, a way that so many people are remembering her today. But they really are remembering her for her multifaceted contributions. You know, of course, she was a beloved mother. And you can't talk about Rosalind Carter without talking about the love story that she shared with the former president. We'll get into that as well. But yes, when you talk about her as a fierce humanitarian, we're talking about somebody who truly molded the office of First Lady into her own. And not just the four years that she was in the White House, but also afterwards. Remember, she 
and the former president were in the White House for four years, the Carter Center has been around for more than 40 years. So when you talk about their legacy, when you talk about her legacy, certainly the center is a big part of it. In her own words, in fact, she talked about the impact that she hopes she leaves behind. And so much of it had to do with mental health advocacy. Take a look. I hope my legacy continues I mean, more than just First Lady, because Carter Center has been an integral part of our lives, I would think, and our motto is waging peace, fighting disease, and building hope. And um, I hope that I have contributed something to mental health uh, issues and help improve a little bit people, the lives of people living with mental illnesses. And I think, Hallie, she would be so touched to know that inside there is a book inside the Carter Center where people can come and leave remembrances or tributes. I was flipping through it earlier today and I saw names from around the country, including Florida, Chicago. But one person at least specifically thanked her for her help on the mental health issue, Hallie. You talked about and just pull on this thread a little bit, Lane, because I, you know, I, I know, obviously living in Washington, having covered the White House, um, the, the love story between Jimmy Carter and Rosalind Carter is just epic, right? I mean, it's just, it's just incredibly beautiful. They, they appeared back in September, and it was sort of a surprise to people to see them at um, the, peanut, the Peanut Festival. People didn't think that, that Jimmy would show up. Former President Carter. Yeah, you know. Absolutely. You talk about the fact that this was an epic love story. It's also one that's unmatched by American history. We're talking about 77 years of marriage. That's longer than any other first couple in the country's history. And really, it goes back beyond that, Hallie. They grew up as next door neighbors to each other down in Plains, Georgia. They've known each other since forever and really have been lifelong partners. It's something that when I spoke to the CEO of the Carter Center here earlier today, Paige Alexander, she underscored that. She talked about their love being on full display here during their work. Here's what she had to say. They would, they would be seen walking from their apartment down to the workout room, holding hands in the middle of the day. Uh, they really, they complimented each other. They could finish each other's sentences. Uh, she would always say that, you know, she was just standing by Jimmy, but he was very quick to say that she was really his most astute political operative. And there are going to be three days worth of remembrances for the former first lady Monday through Wednesday, of course, here in Atlanta for part of it, and then culminating down in her beloved Plains, Georgia, where she'll be laid to rest, Hallie. Blaine Alexander, thank you so much. I'll take you overseas now because tonight the rest of the world is coming to terms with the brand new Argentinian president-elect just voted into office. A libertarian and former TV talking head described as Trump-esque with four cloned dogs reportedly set to take a spiritual trip here to the U.S. and other places before his inauguration next month. As we lay out in tonight's breakdown with Argentina's economy in meltdown mode and Javier Millet promising to carve up government, other leaders are now watching and waiting to see what happens to one of the biggest countries in South America. This man, newly elected as the next president of Argentina. So why is he waving around a chainsaw? His name is Javier Millet, the chainsaw, a symbol of how he plans to carve up Argentina's government and its economy in the middle of its worst economic crisis in decades. Porque hoy comienza la reconstrucción de Argentina. Millet's victory, unprecedented since he's the first libertarian head of state ever elected and one of the rare third-party winners in a two-party system. Like another TV celebrity turned president, Millet made himself a household name on TV. Sound familiar? A celebrity on shows in Argentina, known for his outbursts against the ruling class and who's also made headlines for his five clone dogs, describing them as his best strategists. He was elected to Argentina's Congress just two years ago, describing himself as an anarcho-capitalist, with inflation spiking and prices doubling in the last year in Argentina. Millet wants to get rid of the central bank, eliminate most business regulations, and replace the peso with the U.S. dollar. Remember that chainsaw? He wants to chop entire government departments. Ministerio de Cultura, afuera. Ministerio de Ambiente y Desarrollo Sostenible, afuera. Ministerio de las Mujeres y Género y Diversidad, 
afuera. The drama drawing crowds at rallies. Some people dressed in elaborate chainsaw costumes. One person even getting Millet's name tattooed on their wrist. His loyal supporters thrilled he's taking office. I support Javier Millet because I need a change. I want a change for my country that I deeply love. And we've been suffering many years of decadence. I'm very happy. I'm happy to see Argentina didn't get lost in Massa's populism and all this disgusting progressivism that doesn't work anymore. But Millet remains controversial. Not everyone on board. I personally didn't vote for him because I felt like it was a leap into the void. God willing, he surprises us. So, a huge upset. Again, remind you of anybody here in this country back in 2016, but as a political outsider, Millet is probably going to need to make some compromises with members of Congress, according to Argentinians, to try to get anything done. We'll be watching to see how he navigates that. Coming up here on the show, some new research suggests a certain type of belly fat could be linked to Alzheimer's. Why even losing the fat may not cut your risk. So a new study out tonight finds a specific type of belly fat could be linked to more of a risk for developing Alzheimer's. We're talking about deep belly fat. It's called visceral fat. It actually builds up around your organs. It's not always actually visible. It can sometimes take an MRI scan to confirm whether you have it or not. Dr. Kavita Patel joins us now. And that is an important point here, right? Because whether somebody is in a larger body or a smaller body, they could still have this internal fat around their organs. And that actually can, can change up the way your brain works. Explain that. Yeah, and it's hard. Some people are asking, how do I know if I've got this yeah. fat? You do need an MRI. But short of an MRI, what we usually see is that your waist is bigger than your hips. So you can oh. even see that. So you can be skinny and kind of have like a bigger waist than your hips. And then usually in people with visceral fat, we see prediabetes or diabetes or insulin resistance. So draw a line to us from this kind of fat between what it does that and what it does to your brain. Yeah, here. yeah. And, and this study was small, so I don't want to make these huge leaps like people with this kind of Very fat. Very good. Thank this you. Thing. Yes. However, what it points to is this growing body of evidence that this kind of fat, and it's the, not the under the skin fat, it's like you said, around the organs, points to a lot of inflammation. That inflammation and some of the brain changes we see with it point to early signs of Alzheimer's or things that look like they could become Alzheimer's even 15 years down the line. They also show some significant brain changes around around relays of communication. So sometimes we talk about people not being able to respond as quickly, right. having word finding problems. Some of that could start with these signals, inflammation in your body and that fat around your organs. So then how does one decrease inflammation if yeah. you're at risk for it, right? Because that, that seems to be the question. Right. This isn't about, oh, I need to like quote unquote, go on a quote unquote diet or whatever, right? right? right. Like this is something different. So it's definitely something different. And, and remember in the context of Alzheimer's, millions of people that have Alzheimer's were also trying to figure out all the other diseases that could be associated with this. So it does start with the basics. It's things that decrease inflammation, which diet does play a critical role in. But Hallie, what'll surprise people is that you don't have to really change your diet radically. It's just making these swaps, a little more plant-based foods, mm. some vegetables, some fruits, all the things we talk about, not drastic things. And then I think exercise and a lot of people ask me how much exercise, even 30 minutes of a brisk walk every day. So everybody can try to find 10 minute chunks. Brisk walking can decrease that visceral fat and that inflammation in your body. Dr. Kavita Patel, thank you very thank much you. for that. Good to see you. Still to come here on the show, a lot more to get to, including the holiday season, which means holiday shopping. But some experts are now sounding the alarm that many scams are more sophisticated than ever before. We're getting into it next. we hit the season of gratitude and giving, we are also hitting the season for taking with scammers making merry left and right. And this year, new concern that they're taking holiday fraud high tech. Here's Noah Pransky with more. Avoiding shopping scams used to be so simple. Watch out for pickpocketers. Don't send money online to strangers. If an email looks fake, it probably is. But in 2023, the scams are a lot more sophisticated than you may have realized. These are organized criminal gangs, often located overseas, who are very savvy at what they do. John Brio with the National Consumer League has been tracking really convincing websites, product reviews, shipping alerts, all fake. Basically, these aren't the same old Nigerian email scams. 
Just ask a former Nigerian scammer. This is so sophisticated now. That becomes smarter every day. Chris Maxwell, zooming in from the middle of the night in Nigeria, is a reformed scammer now consulting for the site socialcatfish.com. He says scammers aren't just looking for a quick payday these days. They want a gift that keeps on giving. Just one of your major passwords. Since so many of us reuse them across multiple accounts. Once you have access to the password, you have access to their social security number, you have access to their driver's license, you have access to your credit cards, you have access to their bank accounts. Very easy to do a lot of damage with information like that. So here are five quick tips to defend yourself against 2023's most dangerous thieves and hackers. Number one, don't reuse passwords. I know it's impossible to remember 300 different logins, but at least use different passwords for your bank and email. Consider using a secure password manager to make it all easier. And always use two-factor authentication for those really important accounts. Number two, look out for shipping scams. Get an email or text about a delayed delivery? Don't click, don't respond, don't call the number. To avoid a trap, get your updates from the retailer or the shipper's sites. Tip number three, you may think I'm nuts here, but update your software. About four in 10 Americans hammer that remind me later button when prompted to patch up vulnerabilities and it's music to hackers ears. Well, this is me reminding you later, update your phone and your software. Tip number four, pay with a credit card. They have much better protections than most of the new digital payments scammers prefer. Bitcoin, gift card, cash app, PayPal, Venmo, Zelle. If they ask you to pay a risky way, run away. When you pay, pay the safest way. That's with a credit card for most people. And tip number five, beware of really convincing online websites you've never heard of. Even Black Friday deals have their limits. Listen to your gut. If it looks too good to be true, it probably is. With any luck, your vigilance will ensure some happy holidays, at least until those credit card bills roll in come January. I don't know. Noah saw a good ad for a new TV for 10 bucks. Are you telling me that could be fake? <laughs> Go to the store, wait overnight, and do it in person, Allie. <laughs> Here's the thing that's so interesting, though. Um, AI, right? Stuff that's like deep fake scams. Like they're, they're, they, this is a, in some ways, this new tech means a new realm or a new world of fraud that we have to watch for, right? Yeah, and the watchdogs say this is really just the beginning of that wave. Um, the deepfake stuff is scary. The the audio, the visuals of seeing someone you think is someone you know, that's scary. But they're also really concerned about the fact that they can use these text-based traps, use AI to, to perfect them, and, and really just go large scale with these traps. So instead of having to do, you know, potential victims one by one, they do hundreds or thousands at a time all automated. So there's a lot of concern. The best advice is for you and your family, have a safe word. So if someone who looks and sounds like you reaches out to your family and you wanna be sure, there at least is some way for you to communicate secretly between each other to know if this is a real problem, a real, you know, a real emergency yeah. and those kind of things. So Hallie, one piece of advice on top of those five quick ones he gave you as well. Noah Pransky, thank you, appreciate it. That does it for us for this hour. We've got a lot more coverage picking up right now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.